the show that bridges the gap between faith and business. Welcome to Bottom Line Faith. On today's show, Ray sits down with Deanne Turner, former vice president of sustainability for Chick-fil-A. And when we're going through a tough time, and we have to remember that he's orchestrating all these things for our good and that he's looking for us to trust him. And sometimes it's more about that learning to trust than it is whatever the outcome's going to be. Well, hey, everyone. This is Ray Hilbert, your host here at Bottom Line Faith. And we recently had a chance, an incredible opportunity to to visit the Chick-fil-A headquarters down in Atlanta, Georgia. And we had a chance to sit down with Deanne Turner, who just recently retired, actually. But at the time of this conversation, she was the vice president for sustainability with the organization. You're going to learn all about that. Now, one of the things we're committed to here at Bottom Line Faith is not only to bring you the quality of guests like Deanne Turner, but we are equally committed to the quality of production. We want this to be a first-class type of program. If you're a regular listener, you know we really strive for excellence here. However, in full candor, after the interview, we got back into the studios and we realized that the audio quality was not quite up to standards. But while the quality of the recording itself is not up to our normal standard, we do believe that it will be worth you listening to the conversation because the quality of the conversation is absolutely excellent. So we are asking you for a little bit of grace. We're going to now transition to that conversation with Deanne Turner. Hello, everyone. This is Ray Hilbert. I am your host here at Bottom Line Faith, and I have the incredible, incredible pleasure today to sit down with Deanne Turner. I am in the headquarters of Chick-fil-A in the Atlanta, Georgia area. And she is a 30-year veteran here at Chick-fil-A, and her title currently, she serves as the Vice President of Sustainability. Deanne, welcome to Bottom Line Faith. Thank you so much, Ray. It's such a pleasure to be with you today. Well, you know, it's got to just sound incredible to your own ears to hear 30 years here at Chick-fil-A. Why why don't you take just a moment, we're going to talk about your faith journey and your leadership and those things today. But how did you get started here at Chick-fil-A and just kind of walk us through your career pathway here and, and then, of course, share what you're doing now? Sure. Well, I have a really funny story about how I arrived at Chick-fil-A, which is now almost 33 years ago. And uh, I started out, I was really not long out of college and I was working for an advertising firm. I had a journalism background and wanted to um, pursue that area of advertising. And my husband was a pastor down the street from Chick-fil-A's headquarters, and he started encouraging me to apply here. And I did, I applied the first time. It, it, actually, at first I wasn't all that interested. I didn't know much about Chick-fil-A. I, I thought I was happy where I was I, and didn't see the need to do that, but he kept encouraging me, so I finally applied, and two weeks later I received a notice I was turned down and was told I was not a fit for anything they had available. And I thought, well, that's that. I did what he asked me to do, and (laughs) and, uh, we'll just move on to the next thing. But he wasn't satisfied. He said, you need to apply again. And so I did apply again, and and two weeks later, I got another version of that first letter, and I was turned down again. Well, then I was intrigued, you know, to be turned down by this company twice. It's like, okay, what's the deal here? And so I kept pestering them, and I kept calling and checking about opportunities and You know, nothing really happened. And then one day he was at his church and a lady came in and she had a flat tire and she asked to use his phone. And, you know, of course, that was way before cell phones. So um, he said, no need. I'll change the tire for you. And so after he changed the tire, she gave him a card for a free Chick-fil-A sandwich. And he said, oh, do you work at Chick-fil-A? And she said, well, I do. But my husband's been transferred and so I'm leaving. And he said, well, what department do you work in? And of course, she said, advertising. And so he uh, ushered her out of the church. She gave me a call and he said, hey, they have a position in advertising. So I picked up the phone immediately, called and said, I hear you have a position in advertising and I'd like to apply. And so I think they were just tired of hearing from me. And uh, they brought me in for the interview. And I went through a six-month interviewing process. And by the time I got to the end of the interviewing process, they asked me if I was interested in a job in human resources. And at the time, I thought, well, sure, these people are really nice. Well, of course, 
those of us in HR, we're paid to be nice to people. So, <laughs> um, and I thought, well, I'll do this for a couple of years and then I'll go to marketing. And again, that's been almost 33 years ago and I haven't been to marketing yet, but did enjoy a great career in human resources. And then about three years ago, Chick-fil-A began to recognize a need to have a sustainability function within our organization. And I'd had some interest in particularly the social is, uh, issues around sustainability. I didn't know much about the environmental um, part of that, but um, as it turns out, I've gotten involved in both of those things um, over this time. And we did launch a function and a department, and I've been leading that now for about three years. Oh, that, that's really exciting. Now, with all due respect, you kind of didn't really talk about the the uh, significance of your role in human. You just weren't uh, in human <laughs> resources here. So you got to elaborate just a little bit for us, Deanne, and kind of where did that kind of end up there before you moved over to your new role? Sure. Well, I started out selecting staff members and, and really creating systems. We were a young company. We were mainly a regional organization in the Southeast, all in malls, if you remember that about Chick-fil-A way mm -hmm. back when, and only doing about $175 million in sales, less than 100 people on our corporate staff. So that was really what I was doing, is helping lay those systems down um, for our corporate hiring area. And then after I did that for a while, um, I went out on the road to be a operator recruiter for our individual restaurants. And I have to tell you, that was one of my favorite roles because I loved introducing people who knew nothing about Chick-fil-A to our brand. And especially as I got out of the Southeast, I had the Northeast region was one of my main areas. And I would go there and people would ask me about Chick-fil-A or Chick-fil-A or, um, you know, they didn't even pronounce it much, less know much about us. And so it was a lot of fun for me to sell people on our brand that I believed certainly in and, and then had the opportunity to share that and attract people into our organization. You know, our founder, Truett Cathy, always said that people decisions are the most important decisions that a leader makes. And for him, there was no more important decision than who we gave the keys to the restaurant to. That was our representation of our good name in a community. That person led um, a number of employees and or leads a number of employees and especially young people. And so that was a very, very important decision. I love being a part of that. As time went on, I began to lead different and various functions within human resources, which later became talent. And so in 1999, I became the leader of our talent function at Chick-fil-A and um, continued in that role through 2015 before I moved to sustainability. So I um, had an opportunity to really see us grow in that period of time. As I exited out of that role, we had about... Uh, 2,000 restaurants and 1,500 corporate staff and about uh, $6 billion in sales. So things had yeah. certainly changed in that 30 years that I'd entered human resources. Yeah, and we, we hear stories, you know, out around like how difficult it is to become a Chick-fil-A owner operator. What's the real numbers? What's the real ratios that we see, you know, number of applicants versus those who get, I mean, this is a very stringent process. If it was tough for Deanne Turner to get on in corporate office 33 years ago, it's even tougher, right? Just give us a little understanding there. Sure. Um, for both roles, both at the corporate office that we now call the support center, as well as to be a Chick-fil-A operator, which we use interchangeably with franchisees, the numbers are close to the same. Okay. There's about 100 to 150 opportunities a year, and there are about 30,000 inquiries per year for each. So there was an article out not long ago that says it's easier to get into Harvard than it is to be a Chick-fil-A franchisee. Yeah. And the numbers are, are pretty similar. So. so in that case, and, and I want to talk about your book because that pathway of your leadership and everything that you've learned and led here ultimately led to you writing an, a, a really amazing book. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But would you just for a moment talk about what sets someone apart as to what you're looking for versus why they wouldn't make the cut? I mean, those are huge numbers and huge. The odds are against you. Sure. Let's put it that way. What sets the person apart? Well, as you ask that question, for, particularly for a Chick-fil-A franchisee, I think there are a couple of things that, that set these folks apart. First of all, they really want to be in business for themselves. Uh, Chick-fil-A offers an opportunity to be in business for yourself, but not by yourself, because there's such a support system behind that. But these are people with entrepreneurial spirits. When Truett designed this opportunity, he did it in such a way that he wasn't looking for people just to sell rights to or territory to, but he really wanted somebody who would go into a restaurant and represent him, 
who would represent his good name in that community and who would lead that restaurant well, who would be hands-on in the operation of it. That doesn't mean that they're cooking chicken all, uh, you know, right. all day, every day, but, but they're also not absentee leaders, but they're active in the leadership of that organization. And so that's one of the very first things that we look for for anybody associated with Chick-fil-A is their interest to serve others. In fact, that's one of our core values. We're here to serve. Yeah. And we're not in the restaurant business. We're in the people business. Chicken happens to be a means to an end of impacting lives. Yeah. So the first way we're going to do that is to serve. So whether it's a Chick-fil-A operator and their team members that are serving guests, or it's a support center member here serving those operators that are actually selling the chicken, we're all in the service business. So that's number one. Secondly, we, we obviously look for people with a strong leadership track record. They need to create followership in a restaurant environment for a franchisee. We're looking for somebody who their team members will follow and also that can build relationships to grow a brand within a community. So those are some of the key things we're looking for. What we're not looking for is somebody who's interested in coming in and buying a territory and opening a bunch of restaurants and, and being yeah. absentee to the business. That's just not our model. Um, that's not saying that's not a, a worthy model somewhere else, right, but right. it's just not yeah. what um, yeah. Truett intended when he began this model for Chick-fil-A. So this uh, career, this pathway led to you writing a book mm -hmm. called It's My Pleasure. Right. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? What led to the book and what do you cover in it and what are you hoping the reader would take away? Because we're going to give our folks a chance to learn how they can secure that. Sure. Well, the... Uh, <laughs> The story behind it is really quite remarkable. I have always been a writer. From the time I was little, I would work out um, my grief, my problems, my issues by writing about them. And so in 2013, my, da my dad died. And at the same time, Truett became ill and left the business day to day. And those have been really the two biggest business mentors in my life. Mm -hmm. And so... Feeling that sadness, I began to write blog posts about different aspects of what I had learned from each of them. As Truett passed away in 2014, I came to realize that I had more than just a few blog posts. I was really, I looked down one day and I had 16,000 words and I was well on my way to writing a book. And so it became a passion of mine. It really had nothing to do with the public in general, in general although it's become something that people are interested in. But for me personally, it was the opportunity to be sure that those of us who knew Truett Cathy and what he told us and what he taught us about people decisions and the importance of selecting great talent and creating a compelling culture that we would never forget that because it, he believed it was foundational for Chick-fil-A and if we were to be a multi-generational business we would need to remember that and then secondly the other thing that I wanted to be sure is all those people who would come after Truett and when I think that it's been, you know, several years now since he passed away and all the people have joined our organization since that never had an opportunity to meet him, that they too would know what he thought was most important in wow. the business. Yeah. So that became really my passion about the book um, is it was really focused on an internal audience and then a lot of other people became interested. Well, unfortunately, it's not available right now, right? And just not in, and not in hard copy. You're not in hard copy. So, um, how could someone? They can still get an audio or Kindle. Why don't you yes. help us understand how? Sure. Yeah. It, the ebook and Audible are still available on Amazon. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, it'll be available again uh, in the future, maybe next year. So look for it. Um, we're uh, we're out of print right now yeah. and sold a lot. Of, went through three printings, and uh, we'll see what the future of it is. But it's still available by ebook and Audible. Talk to us a little bit about your uh, speaking. Well, Ray, I've really been on the road the last three years. I'm averaging about 50 speaking engagements a year. 50? Yes. Wow. Um, representing both Chick-fil-A and talking about It's My Pleasure. Uh, I really enjoy the faith-based leadership sector of that yeah. and had an opportunity, of course, to be with you all a couple of years ago and several other or similar organizations. But I've also spent some time specifically within either industries or a specific business and uh, helping them work with their talent selection and also creating a compelling culture and really telling stories. That's what I yeah. seem to, to do most of is to tell stories about how those things have happened, both within our organization and my own personal experiences yeah. through that. Well, that's really a great segue. Let's talk a little bit more about your journey. Let's talk a little bit more about your faith. How did you come to Christ? And then we want to, I want to shift into... Uh, 
leadership and principles and examples and those sorts of things. But tell us a little bit about your faith journey. Well, I don't have one of those, um, you know, stop you in your tracks type of testimonies. I was very fortunate to grow up in a Christian home and I actually came to Christ when I was seven years old. The funniest part of that story is that I tried to come at age six and uh, my children's minister at our church pulled me aside and, and she said, well, tell me about a sin you've committed. And I was so ashamed. I knew what sin was and I had committed it, but I couldn't say anything. And so she went to my parents and she said, she's not ready because she she can't talk about her sin. And it's really funny. It's something I had to work out later in my life, this whole thing about shame. I really, even at a very early age, I had I struggled with it. And I was just convinced if I could get baptized and get down in that water, that I was going to, that all that was going to go away. And that's part of what, you know, we learned about, you know, the gospel. And, and I really understood it. But so anyway, that next year when I went to talk to her again about it, I made sure I had a really good sin to talk about um, so, that, so that I wouldn't miss my opportunity for my baptism. So I came to Christ um, very early. And, you know, I think the most significant things about my faith journey is that um, grew up again in the church, really, though, at the age of 15, had kind of a epiphany, if you will, struggled a little bit in my early high school years of my identity and who I was going to be in Christ, but really came to the conclusion that I wanted to go into full-time Christian service, which took me off to um, Cincinnati Christian University, where I met my husband, who became a pastor, and we were married, and so those are all significant steps in that journey for me. You know, as I think about this, it's really a good thing that uh, you found your husband there at Cincinnati Christian University. He became a pastor so that you could eventually get your position here at Chick-fil-A. Absolutely. I give him all the credit <laughs> of that. That's incredible. I, I always say, you know, um, he changed my life when he changed a flat tire. So. You never know what God's going to do. We, we just faithfully serve just one person, right? That's right. So this is a great segue then because uh, as you shared, you, you've had, you know, you've walked with the Lord pretty much your whole life. Uh, so how, at, at a macro level, Deanne, how has your faith shaped your leadership in your career? I might say that, you know, the, um, one of my favorite sayings of Truett Cathy, and he quoted somebody else, but he used to say this a lot. He said, you'll be the same person five years from now, except for the people that you meet in the books that you read. And so I think that the people that I've associated myself with, particularly during my career, have had tremendous impact on my faith and have really helped shape me. So I can't say the principles I'm going to share with you. I necessarily would have said I started out and this is the way it's going to be, but I look back yes. at what I learned and what I embraced. And so it, I, I have three things that I would say were pretty significant. The first is lead with integrity. And of course, Proverbs 22, 1 tells us that a good name is rather to be had than great riches. And a good name is really hard to find. And, you know, first of and if you find it and you have one, you need to do everything you can to protect it. So integrity and leading with integrity, I think, is a very, very important part of anybody's leadership journey. Secondly, and I learned this along the way, um, I can't say I started out here, but I learned this. Um, when able, extend grace. Mm -hmm. Hebrews twelve fifteen says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. And you know, even in, as leaders, we really have an opportunity. And we have to be wise and discerning. We can't be pushovers. We have responsibilities to leadership. But there are opportunities to extend grace, to, to really seek first to understand yeah. where somebody is and then to be understood. And again, you know, part of what plays into that for me is uh, recognizing that the people I lead, everybody that I, I'm associated with that, that are on my team, for example, they are somebody's son or daughter. They might be somebody's mom or dad, or husband or wife, or brother or sister. And I try to reflect on how do I want those people in my life that I love to be treated. Yeah. And I want to treat yeah. those people yeah. the same way. Yeah. And, and so that requires me to extend grace when I'm able. And then the third thing is, and this is very much part of my Chick-fil-A journey, is to demonstrate servant leadership. My very first class in college, I will never forget, I had to take a non-credit class called Principles of Christian Service. And the very first verse of scripture we were required to know is Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come 
to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And um, at the heart of it, and everything that I've learned over this journey at Chick-fil-A is we're here to serve. And in our organization, what's really interesting is the more responsibility you have, the more you're expected to serve. It's not uh, the other way around. And so uh, we constantly have opportunities to demonstrate that. So this idea of integrity, extending grace, and demonstrating servant leadership, I say, uh, to me, have been the three differentiators in my career. So on that note, if you don't mind, I want to maybe park on number two just for a moment. Sure. Um, as one who, you know, you really came up through and, and ended up leading the entire human resources and talent development and so forth. So if, if there's someone listening to this conversation right now and they've got a tough personnel decision, help us understand that balance because where, where is that line of extending grace and yet the accountability factor, right? Because sometimes there's just really hard personnel decisions to be made. What comments or insight would you have around that? Well, one thing when I evaluate those decisions, I know that I need to be sure I'm not being nice, I'm being kind. You know, nice is when we're polite and we say what people want to hear. Kindness is what we tell them what they need to hear. Oh, that is good. Whether it's to improve their performance, or even I've been in situations, not many times, but sometimes whether it was somebody who wanted a job here and I had to say, you know, this just isn't right for you. There are going to be better opportunities for you. It's a great organization to work for. Yeah. But sometimes people will have a better opportunity somewhere else. And so I, I had a former leader at Chick-fil-A, our former president, and he taught me something very, very early in my career. And I love this quote. It's kindness to refuse immediately what you eventually intend to deny. Would you say that again? That's amazing. It's kindness to refuse immediately what you eventually intend to deny. Now that's very effective when you think about leadership. It's if I've got to tell somebody they're not gonna get a job or a promotion or something they're expecting, the faster I tell them that, the kinder it is. Because the longer I wait, the longer they get strung along, they start creating expectations and believing that something's going to go a certain way. And so it's more hurtful the longer they have the opportunity yeah. to create that expectation. I found it true in, in parenting too. Yeah. You know, when we tell our children, well, in my case, you know, well, we'll ask your dad and then it's, well, let me think about it. And then, you know, I, I gave an example when, you know, my son wants to go off with friends on Saturday night and he asked me on Monday and I go through all these things and then I don't get around to telling him till Friday that he can't do that. That wasn't a very kind thing to do because the reality is I knew on Monday I didn't think that was a very good idea, but I you know, put that off and put that off. And all week long, he's thinking he's going to get to go do that. So it obviously is not very kind to him and creates a lot of um, challenges yeah. when I wait till the last minute to let him know that that's not going to work out. I got to tell you, Deanne, I've done right at about 100 of these interviews for the Bottom Line Faith Program. That That is a profound quote. Thank you. That I'm going to take that myself. And that's strong stuff. Well, I, I learned it from a great leader, and it has served me well. And, you know, I don't do it perfectly, but I sure do try yeah. um, based on the outcomes that I've experienced by using yeah. that principle. And what I hear in that, that's really love. Absolutely. That's servant leadership. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's treating the others the way we would want to be treated as well. So so we've talked a little bit about these guiding principles and so forth. How, how have you, now you're in Chick-fil-A, right? And it's known as a Christ-centered organization and so forth. Where have been any struggle points that you've had in your journey along the way in, in integrating your faith and work? Or, or maybe even tell us a, a challenge you've had or a tough situation that really did challenge your faith. Kind of a broad question there, but maybe what would you sure. say around that? Well, I, I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges we, we had, any of us can have at Chick-fil-A because our business is based on biblical principles, and we, we share that fact. And we have a corporate purpose that says we're in business to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that's entrusted to us and to be a positive influence on all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. That's our corporate purpose, and, and it's there to remind us every day that that's why we're in business. But when you publicize that and you put that out there, you create expectations. Yeah. And people are looking for you to behave in a way in which you've stated is your purpose. And so that can be challenging because we're still humans 
And we're not perfect, and we blow it sometimes, and I've blown it sometimes. And, um, you, you know, but yet you do have to be very, very conscious yeah. of that. So one of the greatest challenges is just living up to this image that people have of what our organization is. And I, I would say that's been a challenge. Um, when I think back, you know, just me um, personally, I think there have been a couple times. One uh, was that move from what I knew um, in people to venture off into a whole new path in sustainability. And that's part of being in an organization so long, you, you know, you do have to reinvent yourself several times over again. That happened actually within the HR function, but then there came that time to make that um, move. And, you know, you have those moments, can I, can I really do that again? Can mm -hmm. I create a new mm -hmm. strategy and a new structure and lead a new team? And um, it was very rewarding in the end that I did it, but I have to say, you know, I did so with a little bit of trepidation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe some of your listeners have been through that process themselves. Does anything come to mind as you look back over your career about, I wish I had this chance to do that over again, or maybe a major mistake that you had to go back and address and correct, or maybe even through maturity, you, you could look back now and say, Ooh, I didn't handle that one well. Any, sure. any, any learning things that you could pass along? Yeah, you know, I, um, as a young leader, um, I know I didn't do a lot of things right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think back to just inner um, individual interactions and, and I was, I had really high expectations of myself and I projected those on other people. And you know what really changed my life was becoming a mom. That really changed my leadership for the better because once that happened and I had this other little human being I was responsible for and I recognized in him the expectations that I created. And that was, you know, going back to that whole thing about see to it that no one misses the grace of God. I really had through my becoming a mom was when I really became, I began to understand grace for myself mm. and started accepting that I was within God's grace, that he was willing to give me so much grace and I needed to give it away to others. And that whole process really changed me as a leader. And I came back from that first maternity leave with a much different perspective about the people who worked for me, realizing that I'd, I'd put people under stress. Yeah. I had really um, required so much of them. Yeah. And that it goes back to what I said earlier, you know, recognizing, hey, there's someone, there's someone's son or daughter too. And now I have this little yeah. person in my life, and how do I want him to grow up and be treated? So that was one of the things I look back and go, now if I could do something over again, I really wish I'd learned that earlier. But I will tell you this, you know, I knew you were going to ask this question about, you know, what would you do? And, and again, by no means, I, I could just, we could talk all day about my mistakes as a leader because we all have them. But I don't know that I'd change a whole lot because I have this strong belief that my path is my path and that, that God is sovereign in all things and he works all things together for good. And whatever path I've been on now, it hasn't been straight, but even the twists and turns, he knew how to use those things yeah, for my that. best good. And so I try not to look back too much in any aspect of my life and go, well, I wish that had been different. Because whatever it was, it was God's ordained path for me. At this point in my life, that's how I accept it and look at it. That sounds like real internal peace. That's 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 beautiful. And could, can we go back? Because as I was listening to something you were saying a moment ago about, you know, when I became a mom and mm -hmm. those sorts of things, how did you balance all that? How did you maintain your walk with the Lord, your emerging career, your developing career, being a mom, being a wife, community? How, how did you manage all that? That's a lot. Um, I really don't know. Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> when I look back, I go, how did I do that? I had a lot of supportive people in my life. And, you know, it, it, who you choose as your mate, uh, I'll start there, can be a really, really important decision of what you're able to accomplish in life. And God blessed me with an amazing husband who's been tremendously supportive, a very active dad, shared the home and parenting responsibilities yeah. with me. And, and so number one, that's, that has a, a huge amount to do with what I was able to accomplish and do. For me personally, and I didn't start out here, so this is another place I had to learn. I didn't do this well. But I eventually got to the point that I realized I needed to be present wherever I was. I didn't try to mix all of those roles I became very clear about what my roles were. And when I was in each of them, my goal was to be there. So if I was at home, I really tried to be at home. 
men. Now, if my kids are listening to this, they're probably thinking about times where I, I didn't always do that. But, of course, right. Um, I kept practicing that. When I came up with that idea to begin with, I wasn't very good at it. But I kept on and kept on. I mean, you know, I realized one day I'm sitting at the baseball field, you know, on at the time it was a BlackBerry. But the whole time they're out there, I've got my head stuck down in the BlackBerry and I'm responding to emails because that's a nice time to just sit still and do that, right? But I wasn't being very present. So, and the same thing with everything else. When I was at work, I was at work and I was focused on what I needed to do there. When I went to a board meeting, I was at the board meeting. And that's just a discipline that we, we have to work at. It's not a natural thing to do that. But that helped me a whole lot was the ability to just say, hey, wherever I am, I'm present in that moment. And then just leveraging a lot of other things. You know, I outsourced what I was able to outsource in our home. I've often told people, you know, my kids just didn't really care who did the laundry or who went to the grocery store. That wasn't important. But they did care who was at their ball game or who tucked them in at night. And so I tried to figure out what it was. And, and I, sometimes I would just ask them, What's most important for me to do for you this week? As my sons grew up and got into high school, one of the things I did, they all played high school football. And so Friday nights were sacred. Just nothing came between that and Friday night. And I uh, protected those all the whole time, all three of them for 12 years, the whole time, because uh, they were all in high school different years, so they didn't overlap. So it was 12 years of protecting Friday nights from any other possible commitments. And I... You know, we can't be at everything. And sometimes I had to tell them, hey, you know what? I can't do this today because I have this responsibility. But I tell you what I will do. I'm going to be able to take some time off to do this with you that's really important to you. And we just, we talked very openly about it. And one of the things that I think benefited my kids was, and what I saw them, they saw, they saw a mom and dad who got up and went to work every day. And mm, yeah. they developed an amazing work ethic themselves because of that. And so mine weren't ones that, you know, were calling out of, sick out of school all the time because mom and dad didn't do that. We got up and we, we went to work and um, we worked at this whole thing as a family. Now, with all that said, I want you to know something. I support moms who choose to stay at home. I think it's the highest calling there is. Everybody has a different situation about why they choose to do what they do. And they're as individual as all the, in, those choices are as individual as all the individuals. Yeah, yeah that's good. But... There's this saying, the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. And so when I have a female employee who comes into me and says, hey, I'm going to stay home with my baby, I celebrate them because I think that is a very, very high calling and very important one. So we're all called to do different things and God has a different path for all of us. But um, that's how I've tried to do the very best I can to balance. Yes, life. yes. Well, Deanne, we've talked about your background. We've talked about your faith journey and balance and so forth. So forth. But I want to just shift, if we may, towards this little section around advice and mentorship. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what's the best advice anyone ever gave you? And how does it continue to impact you? Well, you know, it's funny. I actually gave that to you earlier. But I'll add one other thing to that. And this was not advice anybody said to me, but I watched demonstrated. And it's this. Actions do speak louder than words. And so, especially when it comes to our faith, if we want to be a testimony, we don't talk about it, we walk it, and we just do it. And in my career, in my marketplace, I've had that demonstrated over and over again. And um, so, while no one ever said that to me, mm -hmm. I watched it happen, mm -hmm. and I do believe that, um, especially what we do when nobody's looking, is the biggest testimony of our faith in the marketplace. So that, those, that's some of the best advice you were given. Now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to imagine you're sitting across from your 20-year-old self and you're going to pass along advice. What would you say to a 20-year-old Deanne Turner? To myself specifically, I would say don't be so hard on yourself. Oh, that's good. You're not expected to be perfect by anyone, especially God, and give your own self some grace so you can give away grace to others. It seems like it's easier to give away grace to others and not as well to ourselves. Well, you know, it's a funny thing. I, I really went through, I would say that was my crisis in life that I had to overcome was, was coming to terms with this concept. Here I'd grown up in a Christian home. I told you that I became a Christian when I was seven. I mean, you know, I knew Christ from the time I was seven years old. And I knew this concept of grace, but I thought it was for everyone else. 
Everyone else on the planet was deserving somehow except for me. I had to, in, I, real quickly, uh, what happened was I was, I had landed in the middle of Kenya in a little village that was two hours from nowhere. And that was the moment in which I realized among these kids who were so joyful, who had absolutely nothing except the love of Christ in their life, and I, that was the moment that I came to understand how much God loved me and that that grace was available to me as well as all the other people on the planet. Oh, that's fantastic. That is so good. Okay, so let me ask you this. In this whole area of kind of advice and encouragement, right now there's somebody listening to this conversation and they're discouraged. They're going through a tough time. They're having a hard time maybe seeing God's plan for them and their career or their business. Or maybe they're just in the really dark season right now and it doesn't seem like anything is going right. Okay. They may have their headphones on right now, listening to this as they're on their treadmill or on a walk. They may be playing this over their Bluetooth on their car. Who knows how they're listening to this. But Deanne, would you take a moment and just offer your best words of encouragement? How would you lift up the spirits of that Christ follower who's discouraged in their marketplace journey right now? I go back to the words of Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding and he will make your path straight. I think that's so hard for us. You know, there are certain things we value higher than anything else, obviously our faith, our family, but our role in the marketplace sometimes, I mean, that's a, that's a very important priority in our life. And when we're going through a tough time and we have to remember that he's orchestrating all these things for our good and that he's looking for us to trust him and sometimes it's more about that mm. learning to trust than it is whatever the outcome's going to be but that's where the peace comes from to walk through those tough times and I've had them I've had them here in the marketplace and that's what I go back to is that Proverbs 3. I love that that is really good that is really good well Dan for those who listen to the program they know that the last question I ask and Every conversation is what I call my 423 question. It's based that you were just talking about Proverbs 3. So we're just going to go just a little bit further north to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, that says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it determines the course of your life. So if you had the opportunity to gather your family and friends and loved ones around, and say it's towards the tail end of your time, this side of eternity, and you have a chance to pass along that one piece of advice or encouragement, what would be your above all else advice? Finish the sentence for me. Above all else. Love God and love people with all of your heart. And I actually think it's that simple. Love God and love his people. And that's what we're here to do. Well, I tell you what, Deanne, from the first time, I, I, I made the notes from the first part of our conversation, these principles of leading with integrity, extending grace and servant leadership. I just want to say, while we're on the air here, you have done nothing but model those things in our relationship over the past two or three years. I remember the first time I picked up the phone and says, hey, Deanne, we'd love to see if you could come talk to us at our conference. And you just modeled grace, you modeled integrity. And I just want to thank you personally. Well, thank that you Just so thank much. you for modeling Christ the way you have in our friendship over the last two, three years. Well, thank you so much, Ray. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and all of the folks at Truth at Work. And um, thanks for spending time with me today. Well, folks, I am your host here at Bottom Line Faith, Ray Hilbert. I am sure of this. I am sure that today, like me, you have been encouraged, you have been inspired, and you have learned from one of America's best leaders who love Jesus in the marketplace, Deanne Turner here at Chick-fil-A. It has been an honor to have this conversation. Check out her website, deanneturner.com, deanneturner.com. If you've got a corporate event or a leadership conference or something where you need a really godly leader to communicate biblical principles of leadership, you're gonna find no one better in the country than Deanne Turner. So that's my encouragement to you. Until next time, I am your host here at Bottom Line Faith, Ray Hilbert saying so long and serve the Lord faithfully in the marketplace. Bottom Line Faith is brought to you by Truth at Work. If you'd like to hear about new episodes or listen to past episodes, visit us online at bottomlinefaith.org. You can also subscribe to the show through Google Play and iTunes.